Hello and good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's career discovery presentation on entrepreneurship with Bank of North Dakota. I am Stacey Holzheimer, University and Student Development Coordinator at Bank of North Dakota, and I will be leading you through today's webinar. During this session, attendees will learn an entre what entrepreneur is, um, the variety of educational and career paths one can take to become an entrepreneur, and skills needed to be a successful entrepreneur. Some housekeeping items. In the menu of the webinar, there is both a chat and a Q&A function that we encourage all of you to use for the questions or comments that you have about today's webinar. We will answer questions at the end of the webinar, but please put them in the Q&A when you have them. It is my pleasure to introduce to you today our panelists. We've got Amos and Carly Kobo um, from Carly Loves Amos Photography, co-studio, Attican Properties, and We Clean. Carly and Amos are community builders and serial entrepreneurs. At age 15, Amos started the first of his many businesses. Today, Amos and Carly run four businesses from a loft they renovated in downtown Bismarck. Recently certified as life coaches, they love helping others discover their true identity and maximize their potential. We also have we Patrick also Lanier from Golden Path Solutions. Patrick is the CEO and founder of Golden Path Solutions. Patrick has over 20 years of experience in a variety of positions, including consulting, finance, marketing, pricing, licensing, and operations, including 10 years at Microsoft. Patrick is also the owner of Blue Fire Consulting, providing business and marketing services to a variety of domestic and international companies. Patrick resides with his family in Fargo, North Dakota. Last, we have Kevin Black. Kevin is with Credence Energy Services. Kevin has served as president and CEO of Credence Energy Services since co-founding the company in 2014. Mr. Black has 10 years of experience in the oil and gas industry, specifically in the specialty chemical markets. Prior to founding Credence, he held various technical and business development roles with Champion Technologies and Baker Hughes. Mr. Black holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Industrial Engineering and Management from North Dakota State University and currently resides in Minot with his wife, Callie, and two children, Reagan and Raleigh. So it is my pleasure. Um, I'm going to turn it over to the panelists and um, we will visit with each of them. Um, I will have each of them just introduce themselves and talk a little bit about um, their current businesses. So um, Amos and Carly, we'll start with you. Hey guys, I'm Carly. This is my husband, Amos. Um, so our business, we have four businesses. The first one is Carly Loves Amos Wedding Photography. Mm -hmm. And this is our 12th year uh, photographing weddings. Yep. And then we have Co Studio, which is a small event venue in downtown Bismarck. And um, uh, creatives can rent it out too by the hour, like other photographers, um, but mostly events happen here. Yep. And then we have Attican Properties. We have just four rental properties. And then Amos has just started a startup called We Clean, and it's an on demand cleaning service kind of like Uber uh, for cleaning. And yep. so that's running right now in Bismarck and Bend, Oregon and Phoenix, Arizona. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Thank you, Patrick. Hey everybody, uh, thanks for the introduction. Super glad to be here with y'all. And uh, thanks uh, Stacy for inviting us uh, to talk about entrepreneurship. Um, like Stacy said, my name is Patrick I'm in Fargo. And um, about seven years ago, after leaving Microsoft, I started Blue Fire Consulting, which was an amazing opportunity to get to know how companies think about things and see how different companies solve problems uh, similarly and also differently based on their, pro their unique markets and their personalities and things. And as I was doing consulting, I started realizing that companies sometimes have a hard time finding the right talent for different jobs um, at their companies. I also have kids that were getting close to graduating high school that were starting to ask questions about what should they do when they graduate. Um, so about two years ago, I started Golden Path Solutions, 
which really is uh, we're building a technology for high school and college students to help them understand what they what skills they have and what careers they might want to pursue. And we're also working with employers to connect them with students and create work agreements and tuition reimbursement programs um, so students can get jobs that they love, maybe help with college, and employers can develop their future workforce. Again, I'm super glad to be here and, and thanks for having me. Wonderful. Thank you, Patrick. And Kevin, we'll turn it over to you next. Yeah, well, uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for having me. Very grateful to be part of this panel with Carly and Amos and Patrick to talk about a, a very exciting topic of entrepreneurship. Um, I'm excited to learn from uh, the other panelists too this morning, but a bit of background about me. I, I was very fortunate to co-found a business called Credence Energy Services uh, going all the way back to 2014 now with two of my cousins. We're a family business. Um, started with very humble roots, but we've been very uh, fortunate to grow the business now today to uh, just about 65 employees across the state of North Dakota and uh, Bismarck, w Williston, uh, Dickinson, and Minot. Um, what we do, the best way to think about what we do is we kind of call ourselves the doctors and the pharmacists of the oil field. Um, so we, we analyze the fluid properties of mainly the brine that is produced alongside the oil out in the oil patch. And what we do is we uh, analyze that brine, model potential risk, uh, mainly in the areas of corrosion and mineral scale deposition. And then we formulate specialty chemicals to treat these wells to essentially um, enhance and optimize production to help these wells uh, produce oil and gas for as long as they possibly can um, with minimized downtime and minimized cost due to failures. Um, so we, we've been in the business, like I said, about five years. Um, we also do some property uh, investment as well on the side, um, but again, just really grateful for the opportunity to, to be with you today. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. So we are going to start with our first question. Uh, Carly and Amos will Amos will go with you first. So uh, pretty high level question. How would you define an entrepreneur? Well, I'm sure you could look up the Webster definition, but. I think that it's just someone who has a dream and creates their own destiny and pioneers their own way. Yeah, that's someone who awesome. Has I love that. Self driven to fulfill a need in the marketplace. Perfect. Patrick, what about you? So, so I, I sometimes think of entrepreneurship as a mindset. Um, it's a way of thinking about the future and about the future that you want to create. And I think a lot of times we think about entrepreneurs as business owners, and there's certainly an element to that. But I think entrepreneurship to me is really about you see a problem and you know you can make it better and you're going to figure out a way to make it better. Whether that be starting a company and driving a company and solving that problem. I think, I think companies like established companies also need entrepreneurial thinking like the Bobcats and the Microsofts of the world, they need people who can see a problem and think outside of the box to solve it. I think, I think those, that type of thinking, that entrepreneurial thinking, really seeing a vision and then, and then making it happen, to me, that's what defines an entrepreneur. Wonderful, thanks. What about you, Kevin? Yeah, I completely agree. I think rather than defining what an entrepreneur is, it's, it's a bit easier, uh, like Patrick mentioned, to almost describe the characteristics of entrepreneurs. Um, and I think one characteristic that all entrepreneurs have is just this um, unwavering spirit to create and to build, uh, to dream and, and to act upon those dreams. You know, some entrepreneurs are very lucky in that very early on in their lives, they, they know exactly what they wanna do. They know exactly what problem it is they wanna solve. Uh, other others of us, I think maybe somewhat like Patrick, we, we worked in industry for a while, then we started to realize, boy, there's a better way to do this. Um, but in either case, there's that un, undying spirit to create, um, to, to ask, why do we do it the way we're doing it? And say, you know, darn, there, there's got to be a better way to do this. So um, there, there are certainly characteristics that really transcend entrepreneurs regardless uh, if they're in the real estate, photography, software, oil and gas business. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. So let's go on to our next question. Um, Carly and Amos, we'll start with you. Have you always dreamed of being an entrepreneur? 
Um, I, I wouldn't say I started so young as an entrepreneur. So I started my first business when I was uh, 15. So I don't know if I was necessarily dreaming about, I want to be an entrepreneur. I was a snowboarder and a skateboarder who thought it would be cool to sell snowboards and skateboards to my other friends. And I was like, that would be sweet. So let's do that because there's not a lot of places you could buy that stuff. So I was like, let's do that. So I just started selling it out of my car and then it moved to a building and then so on and so forth. So it wasn't necessarily like something I woke up and I was like, I was going to be an entrepreneur. I just saw a need and what lived inside of me and then took those steps towards that. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Do you want me to go? If, if you have any input, Carly, otherwise we can go on to, to Patrick. Well, one of my mentors in high school told me that if you're working for someone else, you're working to build someone else's dream. And I think that always stuck with me. Um, and then when I started to have dreams of my own and see how much freedom I could have being an entrepreneur, um, it was really a appealing to me. And my dad owns his own business too. So they were never necessarily pushing me in that direction, but I saw the example of that I could build something of my own. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Patrick. Yeah, this is an interesting question because honestly, I think when I when I graduated from from college, so my background, um, actually, I was an English major and a math minor at MSUM. So I, I had a very odd education. Um, I didn't really think of entrepreneurship as being a thing. Um, I think what I loved doing and what I love doing, I, it's, it's actually one of my passions is to solve problems. I, I just, I think that's, that's just, I like to solve problems and I love to learn. I like to learn about things and I like to, I'm always, I'm a constant learner. And I think entrepreneurship in a way is the perfect melding of those two things. Um, because you see a problem and you know, you want to solve the problem. Um, along with solving that problem, there are so many things as an entrepreneur, specifically as a business owner, that you also need to solve. Like, how do I find the right talent to help me? Uh, who is my target customer and how do I talk to them? How do I, how do I price this thing? How do I actually make money so I can do this full time versus something else? Um, so I think entrepreneurship allows me to take advantage of two of my best and my best skills that I love to do, problem solving and learning, and it kind of meshes those together. Uh, so I think entrepreneurship has been a perfect landing spot for me. I don't necessarily think if you asked me five years ago or 10 years ago, if I, would, if I would define myself as an entrepreneur, I probably wouldn't have said yes. But now that I'm there, I understand why it's so fun because it lets me do what I like to do. Awesome. Thanks. What about you, Kevin? Well, I, I have to be honest, early in my career, I, I really didn't have a whole uh, a whole lot of ambition to get into the entrepreneurship world, I, which is odd because I came from a very entrepreneurial family. Um, you know, my grandfather was an entrepreneur, uh, my dad, my uncles, aunts, they all started businesses and um, in, in, in many different ways were very successful. But, you know, as entrepreneurs, you also experience some failures. And I think we'll talk about that. And I think I saw those failures and I thought, you know what, I don't want I don't want that. I'm going to play it safe and I'm going to take the corporate corporate path, which is what I did right out of school, went to work for some very large corporations. But um, thankfully, those entrepreneurial, uh, I guess, bubbles, if you will, started to reach the surface. And um, like Pat said, entrepreneurs like to be nimble. They like to be quick. And when you work in large corporations, you find uh, it takes a long time for some of, the, uh, some of those uh, solutions to get implemented. And so uh, it didn't take long after working in the, in the corporate world for a few year, years to really realize that the, the calling was to, to break out and, and do it on our own. Awesome, thank you. Okay, let's go to the next uh, question. And we know uh, the answer to, to a few of these. Um, did you go to college? And if so, what was your major? This is just to lay foundational work for anyone that's uh, watching this just to, to give them an idea. Sure. Yeah, I went to BSC and I got a degree in graphic design and photography. Perfect. I did not go to college. I have been um, just on my own path my whole life. I, school was not something I was very strong at, um, but I was very good in 
a lot of other areas and it really played on my strengths. Um, and I really enjoyed the business side of things. I loved selling the skateboards and the snowboards and that was growing and going well. And I just continued to go down that path. Um, I felt like college wasn't going to be the fastest route for me to get to where I needed to go. So I continued to educate, have mentors, have people in my life, um, to continue to grow and have those education, but not in the classic college format. Wonderful. Patrick? Yeah, I, I, uh, I went, like I said, uh, I went to Moorhead State University uh, here in, in um, the Fargo-Moorhead area, and I had no idea what I was gonna do. I think I changed my major 10 times, everything from philosophy to pre-med um, to history. I, whatever I was interested in, I was gonna major in that. I ended up graduating with an English, uh, an English major and a math minor. And it's funny because I remember at the time as an English major, basically your options in terms of a career was either to be a teacher or we would always joke you were gonna end up flipping hamburgers for the rest of your life because there just wasn't a clear career path. What I realized is that um, that major, that English major allowed me to really be good at communicating. And then the math minor, again, goes back to that solving problems. And so, um, I didn't realize it then, but those experiences that I got in that kind of education uh, really has helped me as being an entrepreneur. But I also want to add to what Amos said. I think college is, is not necessarily the path for everybody. And um, again, if you're passionate about something, whether you have a four-year degree, a two-year degree, a certificate, or no degree, uh, my fundamental belief is that passion will get you to where you need to be. I totally agree. Or I totally, I say I totally degree. I totally agree. With that, absolutely. Um, Kevin, what about you? Yeah, ditto. Uh, agree 100%. Um, I did uh, go to college. I went to North Dakota State University, so go Bison for all the Bison fans out there. Um, graduated in 2010 with a degree in industrial engineering and management. Um, I think what's interesting, I, I did an internship out in Washington, D.C. for a senator. thought I wanted to go to the politics route spent a summer in the swamp and realized very quickly I, I wanted nothing to do with that lifestyle. Um, did my other internships in the medical uh, medical device industry, which was fascinating, really interesting, but I really wanted to stay here in North Dakota. That, that was really my passion. Um, uh, my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, was from North Dakota, from an egg community, and we really wanted to live in North Dakota and raise our family in North Dakota which one thing led to another uh, through connections, um, landed in oil and gas. And for sure, the one thing that my degree did for me as an industrial engineer, you're constantly thinking about optimization and efficiency. How do you do it better? And that really is what, uh, more than anything, just that mindset of thinking sparked the, the I guess, the genesis of Credence Energy Services. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so let's let's get into this one. How was your business born, Amos? I love your uh, your story of selling the skateboards out of your car. Um, but I know you guys have four businesses between uh, between the two of you. How were your businesses born? Um, well, photography started as a hobby, like it does for most people, and then. I volunteered with a nonprofit for a year and they knew I was kind of interested in photography. And so for some reason they trusted me with their expensive camera, even though I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> and that's when I first started photographing people and just learned how much I love interacting with people in that way, how much I love capturing moments like that. So when I moved back to Bismarck after that year, um, Amos and I were involved with Young Life, a youth ministry, and so I just started taking pictures of any of my girls that would let me for their senior photos and just saying, hey, I don't know if it'll be good at all, but um, I'll do it for free, and that's just how I started practicing, and then it just started snowballing and eventually segued into weddings, which is what we love doing now, working with couples. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, just like so many of our other our other businesses, it uh, they all started in different spots, and I don't want to take up a lot of a lot of people's time. But like with our like our studio space that we rent out, we we just realized we were shooting a lot of weddings, 
And we started doing a lot of destination weddings. We were bouncing around the world and we had this space here that was beautiful and needed to be used. So let's start renting it out to other photographers. And then we ended up separating it and opening it up so that we could eventually make it into a venue for people to rent space. Cause they'd be like, oh, this would be cool to have a baby shower here. Yeah, it would. Okay. You know, so these things just kind of grow yeah, and just mature evolve over and time. evolve. So mm -hmm. photography ended up into a studio space, which ended up being a shared studio space, which ended up being a venue. And a lot of our businesses kind of, you just follow the path of the need you follow the path of your passions and you see these holes that mm -hmm. naturally need, need to be fixed. And, and if you can be the person to do it, that'd be great. Awesome. Thank you. What about you, Patrick? Yeah, actually, it's kind of funny uh, that that kind of snowball effect uh, applied uh, both to, uh, well, particularly to Golden Pass Solutions. So as a consultant, some of my, when I would work with some of my clients, um, they would have gaps in terms of their current workforce, uh, certain skills that they needed. And that was one of the reasons why they would have consultants come in and help them. Um, but what I realized is even with some of their long, their their positions that they were, you know, whatever they were maybe going through an organizational redesign or they needed a different type of role, they would sometimes struggle to find the right person for that job or they would find somebody and then that person would stay in the job for a long time. And so again, kind of going back to what we've all been talking about, I started noticing a problem there. So there's an issue. Uh, this, this company is looking for a certain type of talent and they have, they're having a hard time finding it. And honestly, in this particular case, it was because there was really, there really wasn't a degree there wasn't really um, a way to even define the role. It was even it was even kind of hard to describe it. Um, so I'm thinking about that. At the same time, like I mentioned earlier, I have uh, my own children who are starting to ask about, you know, what should they do when they graduate? And what I realized is one of my daughters would be a really great fit for this job um, with this company I was working for, but there is no way that she would ever know that this job exists. Because even, even we couldn't really describe the job well, and we're actually working at the company um, that's offering the position. So I started seeing this gap and started thinking about, well, what if we could connect employers and students much earlier in the process and solve problems for both? Uh, so that started as an idea, uh, started talking to uh, people about this, you know, parents, employers, um, HR personnel, and started talking to counselors at schools and people that are involved with providing career counseling to students and started to see that there's a real gap here that um, that actually with with a scalable platform and a way of making everybody kind of communicate more effectively, we could really solve some issues. Um, and that, you know, when I got positive feedback on that and, and people started saying that would really be awesome, you know, we started making it a little bit more formal. And uh, here we are with Golden Pass Solutions. The evolution, right? Yeah, that's right. And it's funny because my my prior consulting experience with Blue Fire Consulting actually helped me identify another problem that then led to Golden Pass Solutions. So uh, just like uh, Amos and Carly had said, uh, one business concept might have led to another business concept. And then pretty soon you've got this kind of end to end uh, perspective that really helps you uh, solve problems more effectively for the people you're trying to help. Right. Yes, absolutely. How about you, Kevin? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, our business is a specialty chemical business, and at the risk of putting you all to sleep with the chemistry lesson, I'll, I'll say this very briefly. Um, one of the biggest challenges in oil and gas production is something called mineral scale deposition. So think of it like this. If you never cleaned the drain on your, your bathtub or your shower, you would see that white scum build up, right? That white scum is calcium that is in your, your, your uh, tap water that over time will precipitate out. Same exact thing happens in an oil well. The water is packed with minerals like iron and calcium, and over time they'll precipitate out in the tubing and eventually plug off, and that's bad because you're not making any oil and gas. So what I found as I was working for companies like Baker Hughes uh, in various technical and business development roles is there wasn't really a great way to clean this stuff up once the calcium deposit on, on the inner uh, wall of the pipe. Uh, the way you did it previously, it was incredibly expensive, it was very cumbersome, and frankly, there was just a lot of health and safety risks associated with it. So what myself and my two cousins did was we sat down and we engineered a, a very specialized truck that could, number one, safely apply the chemistry, but more or less shrink the footprint from 
five or six different pieces of equipment into one single piece of equipment and very cost effectively remove this mineral scale deposition from surface all the way two miles underground where we're producing from the reservoir. Um, the crazy part was, you know, I quit my job at Baker Hughes in November of 2014. And if anybody remembers, that was that was pretty much the height of the oil boom. Oil was still about $80 a barrel. And of course, you know, nothing goes as planned when you're an entrepreneur, right? Um, our equipment was supposed to show up. This truck that we engineered was supposed to show up in December. Well, December went by, January, February, March, and eventually on April 10th, 2015, our truck showed up. And what happened in those four or five months, oil plummeted to $42 a barrel. Uh, my one business partner and cousin was having his second child. The other one was having his first and my wife and I were pregnant. So I think we were, at least I was freaking out inside a little bit. Uh, absolutely 100% true. But, you know, what we realized is in the midst of all this chaos, our, our business model was actually a little bit more sustainable than some of the other ones because we were offering something that was safer. We were offering something that um, was more affordable and that put us in high demand. Once we figured out and, and tried to master that skill set, um, they began asking us, well, boy, it'd be a lot easier if we could prevent this scale from forming in the first place. Just like if you, it's, it's much easier to take care of your body exercise, eat properly than it is to have to go in and have triple bypass heart surgery, right? So let's prevent it. And and just like, you know, everyone else here, it snowballed and we pivoted and we got into the business of preventing this stuff from happening in the first place. And now the prevention side of the business is about 85% of our revenue. The, the remediation part is only about 10 to 15. Um, and believe me, we'd much rather be on the prevention side than having to deal with the problems. So. Wow, wonderful. Okay, going on to the next question. What has been your greatest failure and what did it teach you? <laughs> um, I would say, man, I don't know. All, all, all these things you're hearing all these stories like there there's all these micro failures yeah. which ends up creating the benefit and actually the thing that makes you the most valuable is is because you've learned through those failures so it's hard to look back and be like oh man this is the worst uh, but the first one that comes to mind is uh like our company we clean that we started um more tech-based we really wanted to create and move this market um from the cleaning industry it was a great idea but the idea before that we thought was a great idea and we worked on that idea as a group me and a couple friends for over a year didn't get paid anything spent a lot of money developing thinking working out these issues and then realizing this is we're, we're fighting an uphill battle and we were you know, because we're a little, do a little bit of real estate, we're like, oh, we wanted to do an Airbnb. And one of my other partners had an Airbnb, but the thought of having a cleaner come and do this was like such a huge issue. So we're like, wait a minute, why don't we take all the knowledge that we've been doing for this one idea and let's shift it into the cleaning industry and let's solve this problem because Airbnb is growing like crazy. And a lot of people are valuing their time a lot more and they could use a cleaner okay let's pivot to that and that just rocketed and changed our trajectory completely it was a completely different idea but all the same principles just in a completely different industry and now we're you know where we are today which is crazy so lots of lots of failure for a year and a half but it created something that produced something in the future that's awesome i love that um so it's something that you never a couple years beforehand or even a year prior never even knew that that's where you would be and then here you are and it's just doing amazing mm -hmm. fantastic patrick yeah. how about you yeah so um this is always an interesting question and um and there's one experience that comes to mind uh, with golden pass solutions and it was well i know uh somebody that was involved in this might be on this call but um we were we went to visit a, a school in north dakota um, that was really excited about our application. And we walked into the room and they were literally like, we don't even need to see a demo of it, um, we want it. 
And we're like, well, no, we need to show you a demo of it. And at, at the end of the demo, uh, the, the question came up like, there, there was a very specific question that they asked. So when we went in, we had built an application that was really targeting students. It was really, it was really trying to offer a benefit to students. But the way that we price it is we actually charge schools. Um, we're, we're exploring different monetization strategies, but, but one of the ways that we make money from this application is, is working with schools. Well, we went in with this, you know, we built this great thing. It's super awesome. Let's show you how it works. And, and it's awesome for students. And then the question we got during the demo was, well, what's in it for the school? Why would we pay you for this thing? Because we're not seeing where there's a lot of value for us, for us in the room. How does this help us do our job easier? And it was a great question. It was something that we hadn't built yet. It was on our roadmap, but we didn't have it in the product yet. And, um, and it was the right question for them to ask. And they ended up not moving forward with us until we, um, to, until we kind of addressed that. And for me, it was this amazing reminder that as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, you can be as excited about your idea as, as anybody. Part, part of that excitement is what gets customers interested to work with you because that passion rubs off on them. But at the end of the day, you always need to make sure you're solving a problem for the person that's going to be uh, paying you for whatever it is you're building. They're not going to pay you or be a customer of yours because it's a great idea that you as the entrepreneur think is great. You really need to be solving a problem that is a tangible problem for them and, and providing a solution for them. And I think that was one of the best reminders and best kind of um, eye-opening moments for us uh, that moving forward, whenever we talk to a customer, whenever we talk to an employer or a school or even a student, the, the perspective that we always come from is how are we going to be helping them? And if we can provide a solution for them, that's what's going to make them be a customer of ours. That always has to be the number one priority. And, and that, that experience uh, kind of helped us uh, realize that. And that's been super helpful for us. Great. Thanks, Patrick. Um, Kevin. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll try to answer it uh, this way. I think where what has been the root cause of our greatest failures, um, frankly, has been when we haven't followed our gut. And I, and I don't mean to like dumb this down because believe me, as we analyze risk and we consider risk in any of our business ventures, there's a tremendous amount of analysis that goes into it, right? Um, a lot of analysis, but I can tell you in, 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 in the, the, Two scenarios I can really think of uh, where we almost tripped ourselves up pretty hard was when we did follow our gut, and, and I'm reading a book right now called Anti-Fragile, a phenomenal book on how you build resilient businesses um, in the midst of chaos. In COVID, there's no bigger chaos creator than, than COVID. And uh, the one of the, the concepts that book talks about is if you're having to constantly think up good reasons to do something, probably not something you should be doing. There should be a clearly good reason why you need to take an action. Um, and, and probably one area is for us has been hiring. You know, we're at, we're up to 64 employees today. Um, I, I'll be honest, we haven't kept every employee we've ever hired. We've made some bad hires. Um, and, and sometimes we have forced ourselves to say, hey, maybe if we, if we hire this person, it's gonna unlock all this business or they're gonna solve this magical problem for us. I mean, I can tell you in every one of those cases where we made a, a bad addition to the team, there was something in my gut, and I think the other managers were feeling the same thing, that it just didn't feel right. So, um, again, not to dumb it down, you have to, you have to make the, the calculations and do the risk analysis, but if it doesn't feel right, it's probably not right and not a good move to make. Great advice. Um, this one kind of tacks on to the same. Um, we can just go through this one quickly. Uh, what are some of the mistakes you wish you could have avoided? Um, I guess if there's anything in addition to, to what we just spoke about, you can add it in here. Um, and if not, we can go on to the next question. The one that comes to mind is um, probably close to 10 years ago we were deciding if Amos should go full-time with me with photography because he had a full-time job. And I think it's not really a regret, but I do wish that we would have just taken that plunge sooner 
because we were afraid of, okay, he loses his full-time job and, and health benefits. What's that going to mean if photography doesn't take off? But as soon as he was full-time with me, then there was so much more momentum in the business. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think just jumping sooner, probably. And to answer that question, like, we we made the thought like, oh, we should, maybe we should do this or I should come over, but we never put the pen to paper. Like we're like, if, if I wasn't working at X job, but we could shoot more weddings because I was over here, like we didn't take the time to monetarily look at the numbers and we're like, oh my gosh, all we'd have to do is shoot 10 more weddings. Well, if I was able to work here full time, we could easily get 10 more weddings. Then it was like a quick shift, but the fear and the familiarity a lot of times will trap you rather than looking at the possibilities and what is what you're capable of doing in the future. Yeah. Yeah, I think I would. Um, I, I, this is kind of a, an adage when you, when you have panels like this, and a lot of people will will say the same things, but a lot of times the reason we say them is because they're true. Mm -hmm. um, I think like all the mistakes that that we made building the business or just even in my career in general, um, those mistakes helped me get to where I am. They each provided a learning opportunity. And so I can't looking back if I didn't if I didn't hit some of those walls or if I didn't make a choice, I, if I chose A and B would have been a better choice. Reality is I might not have learned some of the things that got me to where I am. So mm -hmm. one of the things I'd like to say about this question is just if you are considering um, about you know being an entrepreneur or if you are thinking about taking risks within your current role even if you're a student and you want to try something or whatever wherever you're at in life um, don't worry about making mistakes i mean don't put yourself in in into a risky situation where you're quitting a job and you have no income and you don't and you have children coming and all those things that we're talking about you don't want to do things um, that are reckless but you also don't want to necessarily wait for everything to be perfect before you act and mistakes are an important part of learning. So um, a lot of times I hear entrepreneurs and even myself sometimes, like you don't act until you know everything's totally figured out and you've got a roadmap that's well-defined for the next six months. Um, I don't know if that's always the best thing because making mistakes is part of the learning process and you will make them. Even with the best planning, you'll still make mistakes. So embrace them and learn from them versus try to avoid them. Yeah, that's good. Certainly, uh, paralysis by analysis is never a good thing. Um, for me, this is very simple because the pain of the mistakes is uh, still very fresh. Um, we realized very early that we were going to have to scale the business quickly if we wanted to be competitive. Otherwise, we would be swallowed up very, very quickly by some of the largers, uh, large majors. Um, so probably my biggest mistake was holding on to too many of the various non- I guess value add type work, at least in my role as the as the you know founder and CEO of the business. A great example was I should have gave up accounting and and doing the books on the business long before I did because frankly I'm terrible at it. And by the time we got into professionals' hands, it was a mess. <laughs> so there's there's some little things along the way where as you're growing your business, um, I mean we're we're all getting into this to grow our businesses, right? You have to know when the right time is to start letting go of some things so you as the founder, the leader of the business can can stay focused on the overarching mission. And for us, that was to grow it. And uh, certainly trying to hang on and, and, you know, it's your baby, right? You don't want to give things up, but you have to know when to give things up so that you can stay focused. And that, that was a big mistake I made early on. Yes. I can I can understand how that could uh, or see how that could be hard to let go. Um, all right, uh, just as a reminder, we've got about 20 minutes left here. We've got a few more questions. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please enter them in the chat and we will get to them at the very end. Um, next question uh, to what or whom do you attribute to your success? Um, how did you build your success? Uh, how did you know when you had the right idea? I think we've actually covered a lot of this, um, but why don't we just go through everyone quickly and just uh, talk about, especially that first uh, question, to what or whom uh, do you attribute your success? Well, as Amos and I talked about that, we 
that first question, it's so many things. I mean, you could say it's our incredibly hard work or that we were raised by parents that believed in us or our clients that believed in the work we were doing. There's just so many factors that have contributed to that success, but definitely being willing to work really, really hard and not being like, oh, I'm done with work at five. I mean, to build our business, we were sometimes working 70 hour weeks and I don't recommend that and that you stay in that space, get out of that as soon as you can, but it does take so much determination on the front end. Um, and I would say becoming an expert in in your in your field. Like there's there's yeah. a reason why a pitcher makes ten million dollars a year, and it's not because he can run, it's not because he can hit, it's because he can pitch. Um, every one of us that are on this panel have our own skill sets and become an expert in our own field that we know and we own and we take pride in, and we get more education even though we fail, we bounce back up. Um, I think just to become that expert in the thing that you love, if you're an expert in makeup, you can make a ton of money on YouTube, just like, because you're the best at, you know, like now in the world that we live in, if you're an expert, you can get paid. Um, but another thing I would just, I want to quickly say is don't get sold success. Um, you don't, success doesn't mean that you have this giant house and you have all these cars and boats. Cause sometimes when you have all those things, you realize that those are the things that end up owning you. And that's why you have to work. And that's why you have to do stuff because you have this idea of what success is, where I think society now should start looking at a direction of how, what is success for me? Does it mean I get to spend more time with my family? How much money do I to make to spend time with my family and how to what do i need to do to feel, feel fulfilled in what i do for work not necessarily i'm sold what success is because i have to keep up with the joneses or i have to look like somebody else that i know or people in my friend group rather than knowing who you are and where you want to go and i think Sorry. success equals contribution to what are you contributing to society not just like amos said oh i want to have this huge house and okay well that doesn't mean anything what are you contributing to your society and your community and each person that you're working with on a daily basis that's great yeah patrick yeah. i think for me um it, there's so many things. So like like everybody has kind of said, there are so many different things that drive success. I, I'll say like for me, um, I think I think one of the reasons why I've been able to success to be successful is because I've had an amazing group of people supporting me and providing insights, and also that I'm constantly willing to learn. And whether that be parents that encourage you to um, you know push a little bit harder than maybe you did, uh, whether it be teachers that challenged you. Um, in ways that you didn't think uh, you could be successful, but they they kind of push you outside of your comfort zone. Um, I'll talk specifically about even being an entrepreneur. Like one of the things as we as we started Golden Path, um, to be honest, I my involvement with schools was through my children and through you know conferences that we would have with principals and counselors and different things. So as we started to build this up, we really needed to get uh, feedback from just so many different people that that was they were experts in those areas, um, whether it be counseling or whether it be curriculum or or student loans or you know even people with the Bank of North Dakota or people at the state level that were trying to solve these problems for students. Um, we we just had to listen and we had to learn, and um, without their feedback on how they see the world and without employers' feedback on how they see the world and without students' feedback and how they yeah. see the world we couldn't build this thing. And in some ways, I, I sometimes think like my job is just to take all these great ideas and different things that people are doing and synthesize it into something that's scalable that everybody can take advantage of. Um, and then you have all the other things that goes, goes along with being an entrepreneur, like you know the accounting pieces or the marketing pieces or even the development pieces, like how do I build an application? Um, part of why I've been successful, I think, is because um, we've been able to let people come in and help us. In Fargo, we have a really great entrepreneurial community uh, here. There's a lot of organizations that are set up to help entrepreneurs like, like us. I know in Bismarck, you have the same thing. 
And, um, you know, last thing I'll leave you with is one of the feedback we get from employers when they're thinking about future talent, they always say, I want somebody who has, um, who has the willingness to learn and not get defensive if I tell them um, how to do something better. And I actually think that is something that I apply to myself all the time. I am building this business, I'm learning as I go. Uh, people are gonna tell me th how to do things better and rather than get defensive and I'm gonna do it my way, actually I wanna listen to them and learn from them and, um, and see that as a gift that they've given me, that feedback that they provided. Fantastic. Kevin? That was really good. Uh, frankly, I don't know if I have a whole lot to add. I think you guys nailed it on the head. But for me, I'll just say it, it's faith, it's family, it's friends. Um, I'll tell you this: uh, entrepreneurship is not for the faint of heart. It is an absolute roller coaster. You are going to experience some phenomenal highs and success, um, where you're going to feel like you're floating across the room. But know that that also comes with a lot of a lot of challenges along the way. Um, you know, when we were starting the business and oil plummeted to $40 a barrel, there were a lot of dark days where I'm, I'm sitting in my spare bedroom, which is my office at this point, and waiting for the phone to ring. And sometimes the phone didn't ring for days and felt like probably months. Certainly my faith helped me get to that. Um, but also when I say family and friends and kind of referring to your network, um, you have to have that network of people who have, who have gone through it, been through it before you, who can guide you, who hopefully can point out the landmines so that you don't step on them um, to give you guidance and mentorship. Um, but at the end of the day, you have to have a tremendous amount of grit to be, to be in the business of entrepreneurship because uh, the people who you think will say yes to you might not be the people who say yes. And you'll, you'll be turned down far more times than you'll, you'll be said yes to. So it's really, it's the grit and it's the termination. It's the ability to, to lock failure in a box, put it on the shelf and say, I'm not going to accept it. And, uh, and you're going all in, right? And so grit and determination uh, is what really gets you through the, the low times and the, and the challenges. Uh, but the success on the other side is, is so worth it because I think uh, Carly and Amos said it, said it best. When you're 18, you're not thinking about, you're thinking about probably the cars and the houses a little bit more than you are spending the time with your family. And now the, the limiting factor to success is time. It's just there's not enough time in the day to get things done. And you'll find that being an entrepreneur, um, if you can find a way to the other side, the reward of being able to spend more time with your family and contribute back to society, like they said, is, is, the, is truly the greatest gift in, in the whole process. Yes, I agree. That's fantastic. Okay, um, I think we're going to switch here. Um, I've got our, our next slide here is what quality skill sets do you believe you should be, develop to be an entrepreneur? We also have a question that says, um, asks, what advice do you have for young people interested in becoming an entrepreneur? So maybe if we want to kind of mesh those two together, um, we'll go with that. So how about Amos and, or, uh, Amos and Carly, let's start with you. Um, well, to answer the question on the screen, I think I'd probably zoom just out even a little bit and just say like, how do I want to love people and to really have that be the motivation for things that you're wanting to serve other people and then it's not just to build your own empire i think that's really important because you can get really caught up in just building your own thing um if you haven't taken the strengths finders test through gallup i highly recommend that um you take a test it tells you your top five strengths that has helped us build our business immensely um but like we've said so much here, it's grit and determination and just being willing to work really, really hard. Yeah, I think just the willingness to be wrong and to pivot, but still have your goal. And that goal being, you know, either producing that product or whatever it is. And then how does that serve and contribute to people? Because if it doesn't contribute to people, they're not going to buy it. Like if you're just selling it to them just to sell it to them, they probably won't buy it. But if you're selling it to them because you see the need and you care for them, or it's it's something that they want documented for the rest of your life and you can provide that service for them better than anyone else that you feel that they can, they want to buy that. 
you know, like you're giving something and they have the opportunity to receive it. And like, how am I producing whatever I am producing, making other people's lives better, jobs better, either it be oil, whether it be quality of life, whether it be anything, uh, what am I contributing and how am I working hard to be the best at that? Yeah. And just valuing relationships, like in our photography business, like, yes, we make photos for them and we want to make it the best that we can, but also caring about them as a couple and, oh, they're going into this whole new season of marriage. What does that mean? And just really taking the opportunity to look beyond maybe the thing that you're offering and look to that person and what's going on in their life and how could I contribute to their well-being? Fantastic. Fantastic. How about you, Patrick? Yeah, I would say, I'd say like two of the qualities um, that I think entrepreneurs should have is definitely a passion around doing whatever it is um, that your business or whatever your idea is, having a real passion around solving that and being able to push through all the hurdles uh, that will come up to get there. And then also, like I talked about earlier, being able to leverage the strengths of others. Um, and Amos and Carly kind of mentioned that even with strength finders, you're not going to be able to be an expert at everything. So be good at what you're good at and then build a team that's going to be good at what they're good at that's going to help you. Um, this question is actually when we are implementing our application uh, called Compass, strangely enough, Stacey, uh, I know you guys have a, a platform there uh, called Compass as well. But when we're doing this in schools, we focus, we actually talk a little bit about um, entrepreneurship as a skill. Um, in our model, it's called enterprising. But some of the things that a young person can do to explore that part of themselves and see if they like it is uh, try out DECA. Um, participate in DECA. That's a really great opportunity to kind of hone those chops. If you like marketing and business classes, if your school has like a retail, um, uh, like a store that you can um, try to figure out how to uh, help grow and sell, um, sell whatever it is that you're selling. Actually, even fundraising is an area where I think um, people can kind of get a, t a sense of entrepreneurship. It might not be a problem you're trying to solve in the context of what we're talking about, but it might be a charity that you're trying to figure out how to help, or maybe a local institution or um, a cause that you're really passionate about. In some ways, going out and, and trying to convince people to donate money to something that you're passionate about, you are honing all those chops around how do I get people excited? How do I market it? How do I communicate to them? How do I make them feel good about, about uh, donating to this thing that is important to me? Those are some experiences I think that students can explore to see if, um, if entrepreneurship is something that they might be interested in. Fantastic. Um, Kevin. Yeah, so every single decision that we make at Credence falls back to our guiding principles. Um, if there's a tough decision on who to hire or um, uh, going after a certain customer, whatever it might be, it all goes back to guiding principles. Um, one of those guiding principles is think like an entrepreneur. We want our, our the culture of our business to be very entrepreneurial. So what does that mean? Um, for me, it's two things, curiosity and courage. Um, you have to be a sponge and, and you have to be willing to accept the fact that you don't know everything and uh, that you're willing to soak up things and learn. I mean, before I started Credence, every job task I did, whether they told me to go sweep the shop or take the garbage out, I looked at it through the prism of an entrepreneur. If I own the business, what is the fastest way and the, the most efficient way to sweep the shop? You know? And so if you can be a sponge and constantly, constantly be asking the question of how do I do it better, um, be okay. curious, but, but then have the courage ultimately to go out and do something about it. Um, we, we talk about curiosity and courage all the time at Credence. And then if there's one more thing, um, you have to be a good storyteller. If you can't tell the story of your business, no one's going to buy it from you. They're not buying. They're not buying what you what you do. They're buying why you do it. It's your passion. It's that you hear that they hear in your voice the story that you tell that really inspires people to, to to come to your business. And so, I think if you're curious, you're courageous, and you know how to tell a great story, it's a good recipe for success. Fantastic. Thank you. We're going to end. We've got one last question that I just want to get to here um, before we end today. So this came in. Um, the question is, there's a huge push for high school students to pick their exact career path, which most oftentimes involving, involves choosing a college or degree path early in high school. 
how do do um, how do adults, uh, counselors, teachers, parents best support students that want to start their own business? Well, um, Amos and I are pretty non-traditional um, in our path of life. And so, I mean, we don't discourage against college. We went to college. We think that that is very necessary sometimes. But I think maybe just trying to think outside the box a little bit and not be so constrained by your life has to go in these certain steps. And I think our willingness to just go, oh, we don't have to do the normal thing and we don't have to necessarily fit this mold that society wants us to, that's contributed to a lot of the life that we have today. If you can have the mindset of being an entrepreneur or that your life is a company, your time is a company, um, if you're going to go to law school for six years, you should probably go spend six hours with a lawyer before you do that. You know, maybe have a lawyer mentor. Go take him out to lunch. Ask him what he thinks. Yeah. Follow him around for a couple hours during the summer and to see if that's something that it's a lifestyle and a thing that you really want to do. Um, and maybe there's programs that, that offer that, that these guys would know more about, but if you can't find a program, just ask somebody. Like, I'm really glad that I shadowed a jaw surgeon because I fainted during that surgery. And I knew, oh, okay, the medical profession is not for me. Um, but she was very smart and yeah. she was going that route. And she was like, nope. But when we got married 14 years ago and the people who shot our photos made it the best day of our life, it was like, this is what I want to do. So you only know what you want to do by going and doing it. So just go find somebody who's doing something along the lines of what you want to do and just ask them if you can follow them around. Very nice. Hey, um, uh, well, to be quite honest, this is, this is exactly what Golden Path Solutions is trying to do, is how do we help students in high school figure out what their paths are. Um, to that point, um, if somebody wants to go into medicine, but they've never taken a biology class and they don't like the sight of blood, they should know that before they go into medicine. Now, there are many jobs in the medical career that don't require you to be around blood and, and there's accounting jobs in medicine, there's finance, there's marketing, there's all these different things. But that's what we try to do is we want to help students kind of give them um, a little nudge in a certain direction and then connect them with employers that can share information about what it's like to work at their companies and help that student decide if it's a good fit. So um, that's something that we're trying to work with students on. But to answer that specific question about how would a parent support somebody who wants to go into entrepreneurship um, as they're getting ready to graduate high school, my simple answer would just be to let them. Let them explore it. Um, if they want to take a gap year and try something or even two, three years, that's fine. They have their whole life to go back to school if they want to go back to school. The things that they will learn as an entrepreneur, if they're really trying to learn, um, will be valuable and will be life lessons that could help them decide another career path if entrepreneurship isn't um, right. But I would just, yeah, I would just encourage parents and counselors to let their let their students um, explore the things that they want to explore. And to me, that's part of, of the journey of life. So that'd be my answer to that question. Fantastic. Thanks. And we'll end last with you, Kevin. Well, for the sake of brevity, I think they did a pretty good job answering that. Um, you know, if if you have a calling to go to higher ed, um, pursue a, you know a bachelor's degree or or beyond, then then go and do that and give it 110 percent. Um, don't slough your way through the classes. Take your studies very very seriously, but know that the book isn't going to tell you if you're ultimately going to enjoy that experience. And so. Um, Never say no to an opportunity that comes your way. Um, I thought I, I honestly, I thought I wanted to go and live in Washington D.C. Uh, even as an engineering major, I thought I wanted to be in politics. I would have never known if that was the case unless I had taken that leap of faith to go to Washington D.C. And I learned quite quickly that that wasn't what I wanted to do. So, um, absolutely, don't don't ever say no to an opportunity um, and, and take advantage of the networks that are around you. To experience, to, to get those experiences, they'll tell you very quickly if, if it's the right move or not. Fantastic. Thank you.
And thank you um, everyone for joining us today. Thank you to our panel for spending some time with us today uh, to really cover uh, what entrepreneurism is um, and to give those folks on the call an idea of, of, of what to expect and, and ways that they can go within um, discovering that, that entrepreneurship. So our next career discovery webinar is Tuesday, October 20th at 7.30 um, p.m. Central Time on North Dakota's academic and CTE scholarships. So if you are or have a student who is going to college after high school, this would be a, a great presentation for them. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks again to our panelists. And everyone, have a great day. Thank Bye. You. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody.